Today we're going to be talking about career coaching for athletes and you're going to learn the smarter way of looking for jobs and how that whole job search game really works. Why is it usually a complete waste of time to send out job applications for example? And how do you find out what kind of a job would even fit you? This is Athlete Story and I'm your host Anja Bolbia, dedicated to helping athletes like you own your sports career. I have the pleasure of introducing you to a real career coach today. Mark Moyer is going to be our guest on this episode. So get comfortable, listen in. This could really save you a lot of time and a lot of hardship. I reached out to Mark when I was in New York not so long ago because I wanted to hear more about how he helps athletes as a career coach. When I felt his enthusiasm for the topic, I immediately asked him if he wanted to come on the show. If you've been following Athlete Story for a while, you know how this is important to me. I really only want to bring you the real deal. And Mark is the real deal. He's based in Manhattan, New York, where he's been helping his clients find their dream jobs for 25 years. One of them many years ago happened to be a former pro ice hockey player who was maybe not as confident in his skills for the job search game as he was on the ice. And this experience transformed not only the former ice hockey player's career, but also Mark's in a way because it, it brought his attention to the need for helping athletes tap into their unique skill set and experience as athletes to find their new career path in life after sports. So since then, Mark has pretty much specialized in helping athletes turn athletic excellence into business success. As it says on his book, the job search playbook that he's called Win Again. And you're lucky today because he will share some of the main takeaways from his book and take us behind the scenes and show us how this job search game is really played. This is your chance to meet with a real specialist in career coaching for athletes right where you are right now. So let's welcome career coach Mark Moyer. If you are a world-class athlete or simply into sports, I suggest you subscribe to my show right now because I'll be posting a lot more athlete stories and chats with world-class sports insiders and experts. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the show, Athlete Story. Hello, Anya. How are you? I'm fabulous. Fall is kicking in and it's a, it's a beautiful season here in New York, but you know that. Yeah, because we just met a couple of weeks ago when I was there. I asked you if you would come on the show because you are this hotshot career coach in Manhattan, New York. And I was wondering, what can you do to help an athlete who comes to you for help? Well, there's lots of lots of different things that, uh, that athletes will come to me for. Sometimes they are struggling when they first retire from the sport. Sometimes they've been out of the sport for many years and have really not understood what they want to do next. Or I'll speak to athletes that are currently playing that want to start figuring out, well, I've been playing for a while, but what happens if I either have to retire because of injury or I'm not playing well anymore. What do I do next? So I speak to a variety of different athletes. So they can be also um, Olympians, uh, current or retired. They can be professional athletes uh, playing baseball, football, soccer, hockey, etc. Or they can be uh, student athletes uh, in the university. So it's, uh, it's a, a lot of different ones, but they all seem to really need the same message. Okay, and what is that? <laughs> oh, you took the bait. Well, the message basically is that athletes typically are extremely confident when they are playing their game. They, uh, they wake up, they, they train for their sport all day, they eat, they sleep, all they think about is their sport. And what I find is that their confidence level is usually way up here. It doesn't mean they're the top person in their sport, but they're very confident in their skill set. But then what happens is when they leave their game, their sport, suddenly their confidence plummets because now they say, well, wait a second. I, I don't know if I can be a professional or run a company or be an executive or be a whatever. I, I don't think I have that. I mean, I, many of the athletes I speak to, they say, well, I'm just a dumb jock. I'm just, I don't, I don't know enough about that. And many of them are intimidated about being on social media, especially LinkedIn, because they say, well, I'm not an executive. Why should I be on there? And a lot of the coaching that I do really is to increase their confidence to the point where they understand all the different things that they actually do bring to the table, all the skills that they have as an athlete that non-athletes don't necessarily have. What could be some of those skills? Like, can you mention a couple of those skills? Of course. So... Um, and look, Anya, I'm sure you're fully aware of this as an Olympian yourself, but, but athletes are driven to succeed. They're driven to complete a task, which is, in their case, their training. 
um, they are very coachable and manageable, which is very, very important, especially today, because I think a lot of criticisms I hear are that most people are now working much better independently and don't necessarily take direction too well. So if, uh, if an athlete is very coachable, that means that a manager will be able to basically manage them. Um, they are also very comfortable in front of the media usually and in front of people. So they can be involved with um, media relations or um, any sort of promotional activities. They, they're used to doing that. And I think what many athletes don't realize is that the average person, 95, 99% of them don't like to be up on a stage. They don't like to be in front of a camera. They're very nervous about that. Um, so there's, there's a, and I just scratched the surface. There are so many different capabilities. I mean, uh, many athletes uh, have to learn playbooks and learn plays for their team sports. And um, that can be very challenging because they're, they need to learn them very quickly. But that, that shows that they're, it, it's very easy for them to learn a new, a new thing, a new di direction, a new topic. And all of these things are very important to a hiring manager, especially the work ethic that they have. I mean, that, uh, you know, a lot of athletes don't necessarily realize that, but the fact that they've been used to being somewhere every morning at 6 a.m. or every night at whatever it is, or going to the weight room at whatever, or going on the ski hill at whatever time, and every single day, that is something a hiring manager loves to hear and see. So these are just a few, but you know, I think a lot I could of add maybe yeah. what I think, when, and from the people I've been working with, uh, coaching also, this growth mindset that most athletes have that we don't usually just accept that there's something we're not good at. If we see we're lacking, we're willing to do the effort and 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 change that. So there's another patience in the process and trust in the process that that you can actually learn new skills by practicing in. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing when you were skiing, I'm, I'm assuming that a coach would say, hey, Anya, you should try this instead of that or try doing a little bit more of whatever. Or Use your left knee instead of your right or whatever it is. And you would you would do it and you would try it and you would see that it worked and it succeeded. And, you know, I think in corporate, the corporate world or the entrepreneurial world, a lot of times people are reluctant to take advice from others or expertise from others. And that, but but athletes are used to that and they, they're used to, as long as they see the results, then they're more than happy to, to make the change. And I think that's, a, that's a very critical, you're right. It's an important, important mindset. Absolutely. Okay. You have the first prop. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is your book. I love it. Win again. Turn athletic excellence into business success. Can you tell us about this book? What, what made you write this in the first place? That's a great question. Thank you. So the short version, and uh, there's almost never a short version, but I'll try. Um, I had been coaching a retired NHL hockey player, and and his story is that he'd been out of his sport for 10 years. He played for 13 years. He was a pretty successful player, but then he sort of didn't know what to do when he got out, and then he was really kind of depressed about it. He then started doing what they call day trading in the U.S. anyway, where he was just buying and selling stocks on his own from home. And he'd done that for seven years, but you know, he had a wife, he had kids, and he just kind of felt like he wasn't contributing anymore. He wasn't relevant anymore. And he was really kind of depressed. And um, when we started speaking, we talked about the importance of changing the mindset and then being very proactive and really extending a network. And then he got onto LinkedIn and he started getting some meetings and some interviews. And then within five weeks from when we first spoke until he, he, I mean, he got an offer and he accepted it to work on a trading desk in, uh, in Michigan where he lives. And he was completely caught off guard and, and shocked that he could go from being on his couch and doing the day trading and being kind of, depressed all the way to accepting a job in just five weeks. And I said, look, these kind of transitions can happen very quickly if you put the work and the time into it and just starting to leverage your network and increase it and grow it and then run with it. And so then at the end of the, at the coaching, he said, Mark, you know, you've really transformed my life and my family's life. And I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful and, uh, you know, I'm so happy. Thank you so much. And I, I was really 
almost caught off guard from that because usually the people that I've coached before, especially people that are professionals, they sort of say, thank you, Mark. Hey, I really appreciate it. But he was really heartfelt. And I was kind of like I was shocked. And so then he said, Mark, you really need to focus on athletes. Athletes desperately need guidance when they retire and even before they retire, but when they retire and after they retire. And he said, and right now, it's so hard to find good advice. And I said, oh, interesting. And I was planning all along on writing a book about my job search techniques, which are sort of a little bit different than most. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to write it for athletes. And I'm going to make sure that I give <clears throat> basically my entire coaching program into a book, step-by-step -step guidance. And to me, it's as long as you give an athlete steps to do and – and uh, tips and strategies that they can follow, and then they can see the results. They'll they'll do them, and they'll succeed. And so that's that's the that was the main uh, idea behind writing this book. I um, I mean, it took a little while to do, but it was I love doing it. And it's um, for those people that actually read through the whole thing, they'll say, "Wow, this is really a great book to get this done." It's not meant to be necessarily a motivational thing like go get them and you'll do great it's meant to say well go get them you'll do great but this is how you got to do it and if you do it this way then the results will be there it's a very um, very hands-on book like this is what it takes do this do this do this the first half is more or less about finding what your value is and how you can be of value to others based on your story and experience and skill set as an athlete and then the second part is about reaching out and networking and, and all of that. If we start with the first, about finding your own skill set and the value that you can add to other people, because that's probably where you would start when you have to figure out what are you going to do next, right? Well, absolutely. And, and what's interesting about that is that I think many people focus on, well, gee, I think I should be a, a blank. And, and they try to be very specific about a job that they should do. And what I try to say is, look, Figure out instead what elements of a job that you think you'd really love doing or running a business that you'd love doing. And maybe it's something that you're very creative or you're very um, analytical or um, you're very, uh, you like to be in front of people or you don't like to be in front of people. But the point is that if you can determine the elements of what you would do that you'd love to do, then from there it becomes easier because actually you're going to find that there are other jobs or types of businesses you'd love to run that end up falling into place because of what you just discovered by yourself. And, you know, all the time I tell people it's important to have a very focused approach on what you'd like to do, but then you'll also see that as you start pursuing people in the, in the companies and the industries you want to be in and you start chatting with them, you'll see that they have ideas that may take you this way or take you this way that you never thought of. And it happens all the time with the people that I coach. They, a lot of times they'll end up doing something very different from what they originally thought they would do, but they're thrilled about it and they, they never thought of it. You know, um, one of the people I'm coaching now, she, she uh, is a, a, a photog professional photographer. Um, she's from a different country. She came to the States uh, a couple of years ago and she thought she wanted to continue on in that area. But now just through some of the networking the people she's spoken to, she's getting involved with museums and a different area of the arts. And she's, she says, wow, you know, I never even thought of that or working for a foundation, uh, doing, um, you know, fundraising and business development and so on. So there's, there's uh, so much, so many opportunities that can open up for athletes, but they really just need to get started. They need to start getting out there and talking to people and doing, extending that network. And, and that's that's the critical thing. Having conversations leads to opportunities all the time. I promise. Well, how would you go out and have those conversations if you don't really know what you want to do? And I, I think that will be, for many athletes, the case. Like, okay, now I, I was so laser focused. I knew exactly what was my priority yeah. every hour of the day, pretty much. And now right. I can go this way, that way, this way. And... Um, all doors seem to be open, and at the same time, where do I fit in? So how would you? Right. How would you? Well, to me, I, I find that such a, the, like an incredibly easy way 
to grow a network and to start having conversations is actually using LinkedIn. And I know I don't work for them. I don't, uh, you know, they don't pay me for anything. Um, but I'll tell you that uh, it's incredible. I, I would say 99% of LinkedIn users really don't use it too effectively or, or uh, as effectively as they could. But if you have a profile that really looks good, you've got a great picture, you've got a great title, and I'll talk about that in a minute. You've got a summary statement that really sort of explains a little bit about you. And then you start connecting with people that share common bonds with you. So it might be um, you went, you both attended the same school, whether it's a grade school, university, whatever. Um, or it might be that you're both uh, skiers or you both enjoy um, uh, doing uh, – you know, hang gliding or you like to paint or whatever it might be, um, or you both um, are interested in photography or you both are interested in the financial space. But then what you do is you find people that share common interests on LinkedIn. You can do that in the search bar at the top. What you're going to find is that then you need to send them an invitation to connect that's personalized. It says, hello, Anya, as a fellow skier and, inter and, uh, and financial uh, professional or financial enthusiast, I thought it'd be great to connect with you here on LinkedIn and perhaps have a call in the coming days. We'd love to get your advice. What works best for you? Regards, Mark. And what happens with that invitation is you're saying, hey, look, I love, we're both skiers or we're both whatevers or we both attended whatever, you know, school and wherever. And I'd love to get your advice. Well, that is an incredibly effective way to get people to accept your invitation when you ask them for advice. People love to give advice, I promise you. And they hate to hear other people's advice, usually. But they love to give advice. So if you say, hey, I'd love to get your advice about life, whatever it is, and you say you both share a common bond, they'll accept your invitation to connect, and then you start having a conversation with them. And it's one where you just ask them questions about how did they get into it and what they do, you know, what do they like about it, what don't they like about it, just start chatting with them. Then you can get to the point where you say, hey, listen, I'm gonna be in your neighborhood Next week for you know two days, I'd love to stop by, have a cup of coffee, and then that, that turns into interviews and eventually offers. So it's incredibly easy to be able to speak to very significant people when you connect with them on LinkedIn and you simply have a personalized message. They read and they appreciate and they'll react back to it. Boom. There you go. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I got to say I agree and I, I, I use that a lot myself and for this podcast as well. When I first started, I was like, oh, what? they're not going to accept. But, hey, what's the worst that can happen? They don't accept, and you move on. So right. it's it's really, really simple and easy way to network. Well, one of the things I like to say to people is, look, if, if, you, if you try to, you know, if you send one or two or three invitations out and hope that they answer and so forth, you'll be waiting forever because – you can't do it. You need to send it out to 100 people. You need to find 100 people out there, at minimum, that share similar connections, um, sorry, similar interests or similar schools, something that you share a bond with. But send out 100 of them where you can save it, save the message that you're sending and just simply copy and paste it in. So it'll say, dear Anya, dear Jim, dear Nancy, dear Bob, Sue, whatever. You just change the name, and then the message itself also the same. You know, as a fellow skier, as a financial, as a fellow, uh, you know, um, Harvard University alumni, or so, whatever it might be, uh, blah 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 blah. And when you send that same message out to 100 people, here's what's going to happen. Right away, within maybe a couple of hours or maybe six hours, you'll have 20 of those people that will answer. That will answer. Your, uh, that will accept the invitation. Another 20 will do so. Maybe within two days, three days. Another twenty will do so within a couple weeks or a little bit longer. Another twenty, maybe in six months, because they never check their LinkedIn stuff. And then another twenty will delete it or ignore it. But we don't care about all those people. We care about the twenty or forty that accept it within a couple of days, because now you have connections that you've chosen specifically to reach out to to start having discussions about what you're going to do next. It's it's amazingly easy to do if people do it. But the good thing, I think, for all the people that are not watching this video or are not being coached is that they don't know about this and they don't do it. So for those people that are doing it, they're the ones that are succeeding in, in finding connections with people that can take them to a whole new level and a whole new opportunity. 
that's that's the way I love doing it. So that, let's say that's the easy part. <laughs> now you have all these connections. What do you do? Good. So well, you have to follow up with them immediately. So let's say, for example, I sent you an invitation to connect, and you accepted it, right? Well, then what happens is I get an email from LinkedIn that says, "Congratulations, you're now connected to Anya." And then it'll say, "View profile." A little box that says, "View profile," and most people, they're just happy to connect. Oh, great, I'm connected to Anya. That's great. And they don't do anything. But what you need to do is, I say, immediately, you need to reply back via email, not via LinkedIn itself. They always like to take you there. But instead, through email. And the way to do that is when you're connected to somebody as a first connection, you have access to their email. And it says contact info on the, on the side there. You click on that, contact info, their email address will be there. Send them an email separately. And in the, section, in the subject line, you say, thanks for connecting. <clears throat> and then in the body of the email, you say, <clears throat> sorry, hello, Anya. Thanks so much for accepting my invitation to connect here on LinkedIn. Um, as I mentioned in my invitation, I'm a fellow attendee of uh, University of blah, blah, blah. And I also love to ski. I see that you're a former skier or current uh, you are a skier. Um, but I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about what it's like to train athletes, how to be a fitness trainer. I see that you do that now, and I'm really interested in that, and I'm curious to hear more. I'd love to set up a phone call with you. What's better for you? Is Tuesday afternoon better or Thursday morning? Let me know. Regards, Mark. So then what happens with that email is they get that email, they read it, and they say, oh, oh, Anya, said, Anya I'd love to I tell you all about what it's like to train uh, people and be a fitness trainer. I'd love to tell them all this stuff. Wow, I'm so flattered. He wants to know more. And then you see on the, in the email at the bottom, it says, we'll love to schedule a call. What's better for you? Whatever I said, Tuesday morning or Thursday afternoon. Well, when you give people two choices, they almost always choose one. If you say, hey, let's have a call sometime or next week, they say, yeah, all right. But then <laughs> nothing happens. So you want to make sure you get that call scheduled. So you say, what's better for you? Tuesday morning or Thursday afternoon. And then they pick one or the other, usually. Or they may come back and say, look, those don't work, but how's Wednesday morning? And then you say, well, that's great, 10 or 11, 10, great, whatever. And then you have your phone call, and then you send them an invitation, a calendar invitation. I like to do that just to make sure they have it in their calendar. And then you have your conversation. So the purpose really of this conversation for you would be to just explore that, that pathway as a career. Is that well, the, the idea? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, look, I think that when you have these conversations, you want to ask them how they got into what they do and, um, you know, if they value or if they would see some uh, value in having athletes come work in their company or in other companies that are similar. You know, what you can't do, and I, I tell my clients this all the time, you cannot tell them, hey, are you hiring over there or, you know, or can I send you my resume or any of that stuff because – that's instantly going to be like, they're going to be like, okay, see you later, got to go, whatever. Uh, but if you say instead something like, you know, one of the things that I've done as an athlete is I've been, you know, I've got a tremendous work ethic. I've really gotten to learn a lot about media relations and being in front of a camera and corporate relations. And I've done a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, work surrounding um, marketing. Um, are there, then you say, are there companies like yours that you think might have an interest in speaking to me? Because when you, when you do that, you don't say, hey, I want to work for you guys. You say, hey, how about maybe your competitors? Maybe some of them might be interested in speaking to me. Because then what always happens is this person will say, well, wait a minute. What about us? Why, you know, what about us? You know, maybe we're looking for somebody. And when it becomes their idea and not yours, then you're in. Because then you can say, oh, well, is that, you know, is that something you – I mean, would, would you be interested in meeting me? I mean, is that something – well, you know what? Maybe. Let me talk to my human resource. Let me talk, blah, blah, blah. And then it starts. Instead of you saying, hey, can I send you my resume? And they're like, oh, God, no. Or, yeah, sure, send it to me. I'll pass it around. And they don't. Um, so to me, it's all about, you know, what's interesting is it's very, very easy to go from that initial LinkedIn invitation to having a conversation with somebody. And I know I make it sound easy, but it actually is that easy if you just follow those steps. Promise. Good. Okay. Maybe you you feel that it's a little bit sneaky to go around it that way, but really, what you're trying to do is position yourself so that they ask for you, and you're not asking them to give you something. 
Well, and look, and, and even if they don't ask you to be a part of their company, um, that's okay because they're, they're, you're still being – see, when you have a conversation with them where you're asking them questions about them, it's almost like you're interviewing them a little bit. But you're asking them questions that let them show off a little bit about what they know. And when people talk about their themselves and their, their expertise, they really start liking the other person. Because they're thinking, wow, this person cares about me. They really like me. I like talking to them. This is just the kind of person I want to hire. That's what they're thinking psychologically. So when you when you ask them questions about, you know, tell me more about what you do over there at Company ABC. And you can even say, which would be even better, oh, I read about Company ABC the other day in the, in the uh, New York Times or in the whatever it is. Um, and I saw that you guys are um, – are growing in Southeast Asia, you know, what's your opinion about that? Like, oh, well, blah, 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 blah. And all the time that they're speaking and they're talking about their expertise, they're liking you more and more. And then if you do say later, a bit later, well, you know, are there companies like yours that you think I'd be interested in, um, you know, to, to explore opportunities? They may say, well, what about mine? Or they may say, you know what, we're, f we don't have anything going on here. We can't hire right now, but you know what? I have a good friend. Suzanne, she's over at company XYZ. I'll make the introduction. And then you're off and running that way too. So I don't think it's necessarily sneaky. It's just simply a way to do it that gets you in front of people that other people aren't doing. And it's, um, you know, I think that you're going to find that the first sort of one, two, three, four conversations are a little bit maybe not awkward, but I mean, you're speaking basically to a complete stranger. So you're not necessarily comfortable yet. But once you have a few of these where you're just comfortable talking about yourself and what you bring to the table, your different skills, your capabilities, and then you just ask them questions and you have a conversation and not an interview, that's when they're going to be much more interested in you. Well, I suppose you could start with people that you know, like like yeah. a friend of a friend or somehow. Yeah. yeah so Absolutely. I mean, look. I think that we often underestimate the power of our network and we also underestimate how many people we, we truly know. And, you know, what's interesting on you is that there are, I don't even know how many people that I've met over the years that I can call 10 years later and it's almost as if it was yesterday. We, we, we just catch up again. And, um, or even 30 years ago from some of the people I went to college with. And it's just like almost resuming a conversation. And we oftentimes forget about all those people that we know. I mean, it's, it's a huge, huge, we've all developed very big networks over the course of our life. You know, it could even be somebody like the doorman from our apartment building from three years ago. Oh my gosh, that's right. I remember you, John, you know, and then John knows somebody who would be able to help you. It's, uh, you know, I've always found that every conversation I have, I've always tried to get value from it. You know, it's always a, if it's somebody that can't necessarily help me directly, maybe they know somebody that can help me, or you know, you know, do something that that's uh, um, you know going to be uh, within my goals, right? So it's it's something that you know. Again, I think that once people start understanding the strength of their network, and yes, they can grow it even more via LinkedIn. But they can also go on LinkedIn and find some of the people they've known for years and reconnect with them and, and start that process. That's all very LinkedIn focused and I'm not against that at all. I've done, there's a video on this channel as well with, um, with tips on how you can use LinkedIn. But are, are there any other ways we can reach out? Well, yeah, absolutely, because uh, you can join uh, uh, whether it's trade associations or groups or um, – other, um, for example, there may be um, in your local town um, social groups that get together. Um, and I'm not talking about um, the, the meetings where people that are unemployed get together and they start complaining about, oh, yeah, I've been out of work for 10 years. How about you? I've worked mm -hmm. out of work for four years. Yeah, well, let's go have a drink and be miserable together. Those are not the good ones to go to. But what you want to do is start, you know, anytime you're in a social environment, get comfortable with the notion of, of being able to, when people ask you, you know, hi, Anya, what do you do? How, how do you, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit now, <laughs> but if, if I meet you for the first time and I say, Anya, what do you do? How do you answer that? That was going to be my next question. 
<laughs> How do you answer that question? Because I know you address it in the book. Um, yeah. It, it, it is a terrible, terrible question to get when you're in the transition because you don't know. You don't know what do you do. <laughs> so um, I can say now, like, I, I host the podcast. Uh, I run Athlete Story. I do personal training. I, like, I have different things I can say according to who I'm talking to. And what's that mean to me? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, so why should I care? I'm kidding. But what I always try to teach people to do is that when someone says, what do you do? You don't necessarily answer them with what do you do, but instead you answer them with what you bring to the table. What, what, you know, how can you give them value? So for example, if I was you and you said, well, you know, Mark, um, what do you do? I might say, well, I've developed some training techniques for, for people that are involved in fitness, but usually it's executives that don't have a lot of time to really spend at the gym. So I develop uh, exercises they can do in just 15, 20 minutes that really increases their, um, their energy, their, uh, how they feel, and how they go into work every day. And I love showing that to people like you. Is that something you'd like to hear about? Right, I get you. So I would say I run a show called Athlete Story where I reach out to athletes all around the world who are in transition into life after sports. So maybe I could tell them about your book and your framework. <laughs> well, you should all the time. But um, but I think it's also, thank you, that's great. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, and if someone's a, like, for example, if someone's a lawyer and they do whatever, I don't even know, family law or something, instead of saying, well, I'm a family lawyer, and, you know, I'm with a law firm, you say, well, I help families figure out what is the best way legal, legally to uh, disperse of assets when someone passes away. And it can be a really challenging time, but it's something I love to make simple. Is that something you'd ever want to hear about or do you know someone else who would? And what I do there is I always I answer it with sort of description of what I might be an expert in or expertise in, but then I always like to end it with a question. So instead of saying, you know, oh, well, I'm a family lawyer and I work at a law firm, what do you do? Oh, well, I'm a blah, blah, blah. Instead to say, well, look, I help families really figure out what's best for them, especially if a loved one passes away. And, uh, you know, I just like to make it simple for everybody. You know, is there anybody you know that might be able to use that sort of service? What you do is that that's the best way to keep the, keep the focus on yourself in a conversation. But also, they may have business for you, referrals for you. They may have ideas for you. Or they may say, wow, I, I never even realized that's something that you could give advice and make it simple. It always seems so complicated to me. So that's why, to me, whenever anybody asks you, what do you do? It's a tremendous opportunity to expand your network. So if someone asks a, a retiring athlete, who maybe um, is just leaving the sport, and let's say they've been a, like yourself a skier. Well, you know what do you do? Oh well, I used to ski, and um, yeah, now I'm I'm kind of looking for a job. Well, that's not good. So instead, if you say, look, uh, for the past you know 22 years, I've been involved in competitive skiing, and I'm le looking to leverage that com uh, competitiveness, the uh, my work ethic, and my um, knowledge of being in front of the media and marketing into a company that really is looking to add somebody that's really going to kick the ass right away. And somebody who has the work ethic, the drive and the, uh, and the skill set to hit the ground running immediately. Is there anybody, you know, that might want somebody like that? Well, who's that person's not going to say no. Usually we like to hire lazy people that are, uh, you know, completely, uh, you know, can't speak and so forth. No, of course they're going to be interested. But that's why you need to work on that. You need to really figure out how, how do you answer what do you do for yourself. I think it's you just helped a lot of people with that <laughs> advice because, uh, yeah. yeah, it is a tough question to get. But now now you know how to answer it. Well, hopefully. And, you know, look, this all takes a little bit of practice. Um, the thing I would always recommend people is to not ever make it sound like it's a rehearsed script, you know, that – you know, you say, oh, well, blah, 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 because people will notice that you need to be genuine. You need to be relaxed. I think that so many people try so hard to have descriptions about what they do or where they work or whatever. You look on, on people's resumes or their profiles, and they always have lots and lots and lots of big, giant words. And I say to them, look, is that something you would tell me if I was at a, at a barbecue with you or a, 
at a restaurant and you'd say, uh, yes, uh, as an analytical uh, specialist for the event. No, you'd say just regular spoken words, right? So I tell people just be comfortable and say it in a genuine way. People will appreciate that and they'll want to continue the conversation with you. And I guess you have to be uh, agile as well so that you can adapt it to whoever is listening because you might not want to say the same to uh, some CEO yeah. of a big uh, multinational as you want to say to the local dive shop that you might be looking for a job in. I try to remind people that the CEOs of the big multinationals, um, they could just as easily work in the dive shop. I mean, they're, everyone has a human element to them. What you can add to the one person is going to be different than what you can uh, – give it well, value to the other person, right? Well, that's true. I mean, yes, you need to be, uh, as you said, agile and uh, really understand in advance of uh, chatting with somebody, well, if I speak to a, a professional or an executive, well, I need to decide, well, what are some of the things that I can deliver to her or him um, versus the dive shop person? But I think for everybody out there that's watching this, yes, it's important to treat people with respect, but I think you treat everybody with the same respect. And at the same time, you acknowledge that they're a human being and not, you know, up on a pedestal. You know, they aren't. They might actually be thinking the same of you if, <laughs> if if you if you've had a successful sports career or you have some kind of a name that they might know what you've accomplished. Then they might look at you the same way. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny you mention that because interestingly, um, the, the the guy that I helped. Uh, the, the hockey player that I helped out uh, that was the motivation for the book, he was sort of reluctant to use his um, his playing career, celebrity status, uh, when he was doing the marketing. And I said, look, no one's going to hire you because you are a famous hockey player, but they might interview you. They may want to meet you because you were that hockey player. So it's okay to use whatever you can to get in that meeting. Once you're in the meeting, you've got to be you. and You've got to persuade them that you're a great guy to, for them to hire, a great person to hire. But to me, it's perfectly fine to say, look, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a retired Olympian, you can just drop that in there. You know, um, one of the things that I really enjoyed about the competition was it really taught me to be very competitive in nature, but also be able to see projects through to the very end and to overcome every obstacle imaginable to get to that point. Well, when you say things like that, the person listening is going, like, wow, actually, that makes a lot of sense. That'd be, that's a really great skill set that a lot of my people, they, they give up after a while. I'd love to hire someone that, that goes all the way to the end. You know? So, you know, I think that um, it's perfectly okay to do some of the name dropping. Just don't say, well, you probably know me because I'm Nancy Smith. Well, no, they may not. But if you say, well, because I used to do blank, 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 I now, you know, I can translate that into blank, blank, blank for you. Well, I can tell you that most athletes would never do what you just did. <laughs> most athletes would be like your hockey player and, and not, uh, not make a big deal out of it. Well, what do you what do you think that what do you think the athletes you know would, would do or say or not say? I mean, how do you think they would? Um, what would what do you usually see in your experience? I see people tending to forget to mention, well, I can't even say for myself. That, and that is one thing that when I am in a place where I'm supposed to tell what, what do I do, that question, yeah. the one thing that I always forget to say is that I'm an Olympian. And uh, so the people who know me, they will say, oh, and you forgot to say that you're an Olympian. Yeah, that's true. I forgot to say, but I didn't really feel it, you know. And I know that that will happen, but very often to many athletes. And and they might not need to say that or feel like saying it, but in some cases, it's, it's an advantage, and, and why shouldn't you say it? Uh, it's a huge advantage, I mean, because to me, I, I can't even imagine how much... I, I can't know what it's like to be an Olympian. I mean, it, it's to me, it's, it's an incredible, incredible accomplishment. And... As somebody who might be a hiring manager, I would see it that way. So I would strongly urge all the athletes that are watching this to make sure you mention it, but don't say, well, I'm an Olympian. But you can say, because of my Olympic training and my experience within the Olympics, I really developed a super strong work ethic. And 
the understanding the importance of being competitive, understanding the importance of, of, you know, being driven to succeed and being able to complete a project when faced with it. And that's, that's something that I really, I'm, I'm thankful that I have that in my background. You don't need to say I'm an Olympian and I won two gold medals and that because then it'll come across the wrong way. But if you say because of my Olympic experience, so you kind of drop it in there. But you say because of the experience, I am able to do blank. So I think that's you know this way you can get around maybe any discomfort you might feel by feeling like you're showing off or something because you're not. You're just you're look. You're um, most people that have careers. Um, they, they talk about their career when they're talking about what they do. They say, well, for the past 10 years, I've been a banker. Well, in your case, if you've been training for a sport, that's basically been your career and you're allowed to talk about it. You're allowed to say for the past 10 years, I've trained for the Olympics and all everything I've learned from there, I'm going to leverage into this new career. It's the same, it's the same thing. You should not, um, you know, avoid talking about that. It's, it's something that to me is so important. And so many hiring managers value those those athletes that have uh, you know been at the top of been elite athletes been at the top of their game. I think that was that was a very interesting parallel that you just did because we don't know what do people normally say. <laughs> you're, you're talking about your strengths and capabilities that you're bringing to the next place right. instead of saying, "Oh, I worked at this company." Yes. So you're you taking know, your past and bringing it forward, kind of. Always, always. So yeah. that's why, I mean, if you can imagine, when you say athletes are sometimes reluctant to talk about their athletic past, it's, it'd be the same thing as if I was a banker and I said, if someone said, oh, what do you do? Uh, well, I, really, I don't really like to talk about what I used to do at Goldman Sachs, I, you know, but, you know, I think I want to do something new in banking. Right. And then what the, what? <laughs> so that's why, you know, it's important for athletes to absolutely talk about what they did but really position it in a way where they're focusing on what they brought forward as strengths from the, being uh, an athlete and not just, well, you know, I competed for 10 years and I won six gold medals, three bronzes, and I was in the X Games and I was in this and I was in that. People will be like, yeah, that's great. Write a book or something, you know, but well, I don't care. But yeah. instead, if you say, well, um, as an Olympian, I was able to really, and that whole experience was amazing because I really became comfortable with having a superior work ethic, you know, again, following through with uh, projects or basically goals. You know, I, if I had a goal to make sure that my mogul run was under a minute and a half and, uh, you know, I had a certain time <laughs> to be, would be good. well then, or a minute, 46, whatever it was. Um, I know. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, uh, but that's a, uh, but that's what I would, I mean, that's what I would do as an athlete because again, everybody in every profession other profession tends to talk about, well, I, you know, what do you do? Well, I, I work at company ABC and the people are like, well, we don't care about the company. We care about you. Tell us about you. And that's what they're thinking. Right. right. So that's how I would approach all of that. Excellent. And, you know, I, again, it, it takes a little while to, it's not going to happen overnight where you suddenly become super comfortable speaking this way. But once you do it a couple of times and then you see the results where you see the people being much more engaged and interested in speaking with you and interested in helping you out and giving you advice and connecting you with other people and, and, yeah, and, I, I, and, I, and I know meetings. you mentioned this in the book that if you have an interview or an interview like situation, you can make like a list of uh, how, what you anticipate that they will need. Well, look, one of the things that I find with people when they go on interviews is that they, when I ask them if they're prepared for it, they say, well, yes, I am. I went on the company website and I read all about the company. And I said to them, well, when was the last time you were in an interview where the person said, tell me about my company's performance in 1908? No, no one gives a crap about that. What they want, what you need to prepare for is you. And what I mean by that is you need to anticipate what the person's going to ask you. You need to anticipate what parts of your background they're going to want to hear more about. And then you need to come forward with questions that are designed to create conversation, questions that are designed that, uh, that are not inside what I call the interview box, but they're outside of that box where you might ask them, um, you know, well, tell me in your opinion, um, you know, what are the, you know, are there, are there, um, 
what are the advantages of expanding your company into Eastern Europe? You know, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on that. Well, if you ask that sort of a question instead of, you know, I was wondering what's the uh, vacation policy here or, you know, where am I going to sit if I get hired or, or something or, you know, how many people are you look, are you interviewing or something involving the job? Don't ask that stuff. Instead, ask questions that are going to be – that are going to lead them to speak, but they're ones that you ask their opinion. When you ask their opinion, they get very excited about telling you their opinion. And then they start conversing with you. And the interview goes from an interview to a conversation. And when it's a conversation, you'll do a lot better than you did if you're just sitting there answer, answering questions about, you know. So, Anya, tell me about yourself. Ugh. It's dreadful. Or, Anya, you know, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Anya, where do you see yourself in three or four years? These are all dreadful questions. And you can avoid all those if you start having a conversation instead. Oh, well, that's excellent. So, you... Are looking for a job, but where do you look? <laughs> because um, it's not like you open the paper and look for a job like it was when I was eighteen. <laughs> how how do you go? And are jobs even are jobs even promoted? That's a great question. So um, I hope people aren't going to be upset when they hear this, but I I try to tell people never look for jobs. Because what ends up happening when you look for a job is you look for a job that you you so almost you settle for what the market is offering you. You'll look at a job in a description and you'll say, "Yeah, I guess I can do that." And you know, do I want to do it? Eh, but I guess I can do that. And then you send your resume, and you send your resume, and four hundred thousand other people send their resume, and you've got no shot in hell of getting a job or even a conversation. It just doesn't happen. But then what does happen? is you say, well, I, I applied to 10 jobs today. I got no answers, but at least I applied to 10 jobs. So good job. I did a good job today. Hooray. And what happens, unfortunately, is that morale starts going down because you're saying, wait a minute, I'm a great person. I'd be a great person to be hired. Why is nobody answering me? Right? I, you, people get crazy with that. And I, I explain to people all the time, look, by the time you see a job being advertised anywhere, it's on Indeed.com, Monster.com, Career Builder, or even the corporate websites, right? They usually, more times than not, the job has already been filled or they've already identified their top candidate. And the only reason they're posting it is to satisfy guidelines where they need to, they need to make sure it's posted so they get a, a, a big slate of candidates to come in. But the hiring manager says, look, I want to hire Sue. I love her. She's great. I'm not interested in other people. And then human resources, and no, 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 you have to take a look at other candidates. Well, I, all right, fine. Put a job posting out there. You know, I'll look at some of the resumes, but I'm still going to hire Sue. Human resources says, look, you go ahead, you can do that. But look, you've got to at least look at some other resumes. So I, I may look at five or 10 resumes out of the 400 that come in. Some of them look pretty good, but you know what? I've already decided I'm hiring Sue. Thank you very much, everybody. Meanwhile, those five or 10 people or those 400 people all say, I'm a great candidate for this job. I can't wait to get interviewed without realizing that it's already been identified, you know, it's already been filled. And that happens so much. People don't realize that. It's such a small, small percentage of people that get hired from answering advertisements and posting. So to me, the best way on the planet, whether you're in the US, France, Monaco, Germany, Antarctica, anywhere, the best way to get a job is by networking. And you don't need to be an expert networker going into you know meetings like, hi, nice to meet you, I'm Mark, nice to meet you, I'm Mark. But instead, just extending the network, either going to events that you can just uh, meet people and talk about what you do and what you bring to the table, or doing it via LinkedIn where you're just starting to create conversations with people. The jobs will always follow. They always do. But I always say, lead with, meeting the people in the companies and the industries that you, you think you'd love to be in. And then you, and the things will emerge from there. We all know people. We all have friends or acquaintances that have gotten jobs where you said, how did that guy get that job? How is that possible? Well, it's possible because he had a conversation with somebody, right? It's not because he answered an ad somewhere and got it. Almost, almost always it's because of the conversation and the network and so forth. So, that's my biggest, biggest thing is I always push people really hard to focus on reaching out and connecting with people one way or another with 
in, in the jobs or the positions or the industries or careers that they'd love to be in and then go from there instead of trying to answer jobs, ads, and so on. Well, let me just thank you for this tip because I think you saved a lot of people's time for the next couple of months that they're not going to be writing resumes uh, right and left. And so thank it's you terrible. for that. <laughs> I feel terrible for all those people because there's so many amazing, amazing people out there that are absolutely crushed because they don't understand why nobody is answering them. And they don't understand that they're not being answered because they're one of 400 resumes being submitted for a job and human resources doesn't have the time or the, the capability of answering everybody. So maybe you'll get an email that says, you know, thanks for uh, applying. If we, you know, if we're interested, we'll get back to you. Or you may not see anything. And and it's frustrating. You know, there's nothing worse than not getting an answer. At least tell me no. Don't leave me hanging, right? So to me, forget about all that. You know, I one of my one of my statements I like to say all the time is, you know, for all the time that you invest trying to chase after a job you're going to settle for and you don't really want, you should forget about that and focus on investing your time in a job you'd love to be in and make and focus your time on networking your way into those jobs instead of spending your time going onto the you know uh, computer and looking for jobs that you don't even really want and maybe even as an athlete you would say okay nobody answered my first 100 I'm going to go for 200 now <laughs> look I tell all my coaching clients they usually do 100 you know in the first few days but I have to constantly tell people look Keep those people going and keep, you know, start having those phone calls and meetings, but try adding another 10 every couple of days. Just keep on, keep on doing that because having fresh blood, fresh people in is so important to, to your network. A lot of these tips are great for even after you get a job. It's, it's so important to have a, a, a really strong network of people that you're involved with and affiliated with. Yeah, because you rarely stay in the same job. For the rest right. of your life. <laughs> I think on right. average, people change career or job at least like five right. times. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. I just saved everybody, uh, you don't have to read the book now, right? <laughs> no, and we, you can also check the show notes that I'm going to be posting, so you don't even have to yeah. take notes from today. But um, I'm sure this is an episode that you can listen to a couple of times, and you will have saved a lot of time in any case. So uh, thank you so much for sharing all these tips with all the listeners and viewers of Athlete Story. I'm really happy to connect with you, and I hope we can have you come in and talk again at another time on maybe a case study or uh, someone else you want to share how you have helped them get their job and make their career. Uh, I'd love to do that. And, you know, I know what you're doing is great. What you're delivering to people is, is very, very important, and it's, uh, I'm glad you've done this. It's just, uh, awesome, and please don't hesitate to reach out any time. Always happy to help. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Take care. Right. Bye. You too. <laughs> Bye.